Welcome to another CME podcast episode from NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute. In today's CME episode, Dr. Andrew Cutler will be interviewing Dr. Leslie Citrome about trace amine-associated receptor 1 or TAR1 agonists as a novel class of therapeutics for psychosis in schizophrenia. For complete CME information, please refer to this podcast description page or go to nei.com global forward slash podcast. Let's listen in as doctors Cutler and Citrome discuss the challenges of traditional treatment methods for schizophrenia and the development of TAR1 agonists as a new class of psychotropic medication for psychosis in schizophrenia. Hello and welcome to this NEI podcast titled TAR1 Agonists as a Novel Class of Treatment for Psychosis and Schizophrenia. And today I'm really happy to be joined by a good friend and esteemed colleague and dare I say a true authority on the treatment of schizophrenia, Les Citrome. How are you, Les? Well, thanks very much, uh, Andy. Thanks for having me here. Hope you are well as well. I am doing fine. Thank you. We're going to be talking, uh, as the title suggests, about a specific newer class of agents, but I think we're also going to talk about some other agents in development and the standard of care. But before we dive into treatment, there's a very timely report that was literally just released last week, July 14th, from the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. And they funded this study, and they found that this report shows pretty incredible direct and indirect costs of caring for the over 2.6 million people in the U.S. who have schizophrenia. And they revealed that schizophrenia costs the United States an estimated $281.6 billion last year, with a lot of this going to health care, incarceration, supportive housing, and homelessness. And they found that for everybody diagnosed with schizophrenia at age 25, the total lifetime cost to the economy is about $3.8 million or $92,000 a year. And they actually recommend that schizophrenia be recognized as a disease of a neurological condition and maybe a neurodevelopmental condition, kind of in the same lines as Alzheimer's dementia, if you will, and that that might better serve the treatment paradigm in the way research and treatment are funded, and this kind of thing. Really quite impressive uh, numbers that set the stage for this really big problem. You know, Andy, those are the economic costs. Uh, And one of the tragedies of schizophrenia is the emotional cost to patients and their families of having a life being robbed, essentially. Schizophrenia, as we all know, starts in late adolescence, early adulthood, and sets the stage really for a lifetime of being ill. And what we need to do is, is try to manage this illness so people can have as full a recovery as possible. Mm -hmm. That's very challenging. And you can imagine starting out a life being ill and the parents seeing that in their child. It's a tremendous burden. Yeah, I could not agree more. And uh, because it starts so early, unlike other diseases, heart disease or cancers that may come in later, you're really talking about chronic management of, of a lifetime here. Let's talk now, let's dive in a little bit to the biology here. And when we're talking about schizophrenia, of course, when I trained, I did my research on dopamine receptors in schizophrenia models. And so we were steeped in the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. So what can we say about this hypothesis and where things are evolving? The dopamine story is actually quite relevant still today and will remain relevant Mm -hmm. even with the new agents uh, on the horizon. I have this belief over uh, over half a century that psychosis is caused by excess dopamine, so to speak, in the mesolimbic pathway. Mm -hmm. So hyperactivation of the ventral tegmental area to the ventral striatum, that mesolimbic pathway involving dopamine. If there's too much dopamine, you're going to get auditory hallucinations and paranoid delusions. And I think that will remain true for the time to come. But all our treatments have been directed there. Blocking dopamine to treat hallucinations and delusions has been where we've been stuck for the last half century. Now, for sure, that's been a tremendous advance over the past where we had nothing. Mm -hmm. And so this is still quite very important. So I would say dopamine 
plays a very central role here. It will continue to do so. And all our treatments up to this point have been focused on. And the paradox, too, of the dopamine theory was too much dopamine, as you mentioned, in the mesolimbic, but not enough dopamine somehow in the mesocortical pathway. So it's yes, so, yang here. Yes, yeah, so that's the other twist to the story. And in the past couple of decades, we've become uh, more um, aware of and interested in the negative symptoms of schizophrenia and cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia, and even the mood disturbances associated with schizophrenia. And it may all be related to not having enough dopamine signaling in cortical structures. So this is quite a, a puzzle, isn't it? Too much dopamine somewhere and too little dopamine elsewhere. And we have to make sense of this with our interventions uh, in terms of developing medicines. So what are some of the challenges then with traditional D2 directly acting D2 antagonists or partial agonists? Well, the major obstacle has been, of course, when you block dopamine D2 receptors postsynaptically in the ventral striatum, you're also doing the exact same thing in the dorsal striatum, which controls our movements. Mm -hmm. So we're all aware of the first generation antipsychotics being invariably associated with drug-induced Parkinsonism. So that rhythmic tremor the rigidity, the altered gait. We used to call it the Thorazine shuffle, mm -hmm. and it would be very common. It would come along with the treatment of psychosis. Mm -hmm. It was an expectation. You give an antipsychotic, and you have to manage the best way you can the motor side effects. And that's a direct consequence of actually targeting dopamine receptors directly. Yeah, and there's also the hormonal uh, problem with uh, pituitary with prolactin. Absolutely. Uh, so everywhere where dopamine is involved in terms of normal regulation of our bodies, when we block dopamine receptors with a classic antipsychotic medicine, we'll block them everywhere. Mm -hmm. That could be a problem. As mentioned with the motor side effects, elevation and prolactin it is really quite substantial. And also, of course, you can have a development of secondary negative symptoms. Yes. Yeah, interesting to, to point out, we think about negative symptoms as a lack of motivation, lack of interest in, in things, and the inability to express emotion. And if someone is Parkinsonite because of first-generation antipsychotic, as, as classically seen, they may appear to be less interested in things, slowed down, unable to display emotion. And we can confuse that from a fundamental primary negative syndrome, which is different. Is we can actually treat uh, drug-induced negative symptoms, the pseudo-negative symptoms, as we can call them as well, secondary negative symptoms, by changing how we treat the schizophrenia, perhaps thinking about using a second-generation antipsychotic, which has less impact on the motor striatum. Yeah, of course. And so the big development here was the development of these atypicals or second-generation and some of the thinking was that part of what made them so was ha relatively high affinity for a serotonin receptor, serotonin 2A, which seems to help undo some of this collateral damage, if you will, of direct T2 blockade. Absolutely, Andy. And the second generation antipsychotics are atypical. The atypical refers specifically to the lack of obvious motor side effects that have been plaguing first generation antipsychotics since their inception. Mm -hmm. The first one available to us was clozapine. Mm -hmm. And it turns out clozapine is a little different from the others in many ways, but it, it set the stage for the expectation that when we give an antipsychotic today, we don't necessarily have to deal with uh, disabling motor side effects and we can manage them better. And serotonin 5-HT2A receptors presynaptically may be in part explain this situation. By antagonizing serotonin 5-HT2A receptors presynaptically, we can actually improve dopamine signaling where we need it to be improved, mm -hmm. specifically in the motor striatum, and countering, in some ways, the effects of direct blockade of postsynaptic D2 receptors. It's an interesting concept. It, it, may, it may be the case that this is how this happens. It may be there are other explanations as well. But we do know from the clinical trials of second-generation antipsychotics, we do not see the same frequency of rigidity and drug-induced Parkinsonism in general. Yeah, and I, I know that in the advent of the atypical era, 
there was a lot of excitement around the possibility that these drugs could go beyond the treatment of positive symptoms and deal with some of the other things you mentioned, the negative symptoms, the cognitive impairment, the mood. But yes. unfortunately, <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Yeah, so that that was the hope. And well, for one thing, we don't have the secondary negative symptoms as much. Yeah. So people will look brighter. Mm -hmm. The idea that it will help with mood better actually has some uh, evidence uh, supporting that through its use in mood disorders. And we have for bipolar depression, for example, the use of monotherapy, second generation antipsychotics that, that mm -hmm. do treat the depression. Mm -hmm. Whether it does so in people with schizophrenia, well, maybe. Whether it improves negative symptoms, could be. Mm -hmm. And whether it improves cognition, well, it, it doesn't impair cognition mm -hmm. the way first generation antipsychotics can. They, they don't have that anticholinergic property that many of the first generation antipsychotics had. And we avoid using, of course, anticholinergic treatments to treat drug induced Parkinsonism. So that'll help. Whether or not they'll they can directly help cognition. Well, the effect size seems somewhat small and certainly not large enough for, for us to say we definitely can treat cognition or the cognitive impairments associated with schizophrenia with second generation antipsychotics alone, at least at this point. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good point. I just want to mention we really want to try to avoid anticholinergic effects as much as possible. Adding anticholinergic medicines to treat drug-induced Parkinsonism, of course, is a problem. Some of the atypicals, especially the lower potency ones, the peens, do have some anticholinergic effects, but they don't seem to necessarily be as impairing overall. No, the anticholinergics that we use to treat drug-induced Parkinsonism are very potent. Yes. And if we were to take them, we would experience an impairment in our ability to remember things. And there's been experimental paradigms to test just that in normal volunteers. So it's a real effect. And if I could avoid using benztropine or trihexphenidyl, mm -hmm. I will. And if that means switching people over from the older agents to the newer agents, I do that. It takes time. You can't do all of this overnight. And certainly you can't discontinue an anticholinergic that a person's been taking, do that overnight. You have yes. to do it gradually. Yeah. But you're doing people a favor when you make these medication changes because you will improve their ability to remember things. And we know that patients with schizophrenia already have at baseline problems with their cognition. We don't want to make it worse. Certainly true. There's a, another uh, related area that we uh, that really f should be for another podcast, but the issue of overuse of these uh, anticholinergic agents, particularly in, in people trying to treat movement disorders that are actually probably Tardive syndromes, Tardive dyskinesia. Uh, yes, Andy. Uh, and you know what? This is entirely relevant to our main discussion today about new treatments. Mm -hmm. Because if we can develop new treatments for schizophrenia that don't block mm -hmm. postsynaptic D2 receptors, mm -hmm. then we're not going to contribute necessarily to the development of tardive dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. And we won't necessarily have to deal with this as much. But today, we do. And today, we're left with a, a whole legacy of patients exposed to older agents. And even the newer agents are not completely immune. And we're faced with a problem of seeing um, abnormal movement, trying to figure out what it is, mm -hmm. and is it drug-induced Parkinsonism? Is it tardive dyskinesia? And it becomes quite complex. And to further complicate things, treatment for one type of movement disorder may worsen the other. Mm -hmm. So actually, not everyone knows this, but benztropine, a very potent anticholinergic medicine, can treat drug-induced Parkinsonism very well, mm -hmm. can actually make tardive dyskinesia worse. Mm -hmm. It says so right in the product label, too. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, those listeners can look up the product label and it says not for use with TD can make TD worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, well, that's a, a whole nother another topic that is very interesting and we could spend a lot of time on. But as you said, let's relate this back. You mentioned these are D2 receptors. And as we know, there are five different types of dopamine receptors. What about targeting other dopamine receptors in trying to fix this dopamine imbalance? Well, attempts are being made to do exactly that by targeting dopamine D3 receptors, which have uh, different 
populations in different parts of the brain, the net effect is that actually you can increase dopamine signaling in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, perhaps in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, Mm -hmm. and potentially ameliorate negative symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now, the evidence supporting that actually is it was a clinical trial looking at cariprazine and comparing it with risperidone, long-term study, several months in duration, and looking at negative symptoms in particular. And cariprazine, a potent D3 receptor partial agonist, actually was superior, modestly superior to risperidone. And the, this suggests that targeting D3 receptors may be a good idea. So time will tell how far we can get with that. We can also think about dopamine D1 receptors, which mm-hmm. live in the cortex to a substantial degree. And that's a tricky receptor as you find e. too much reg- Too much going in one direction of D1 is as bad as going too little in the other direction. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you want it just right. Mm-hmm. So regulating that D1 receptor can be challenging. D4 and D5, we don't know as much about, mm-hmm. but we know that clozapine can affect, uh, I believe, D4. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, it's right. Yeah. And so that's must be doing something. We just don't have uh, adequately characterized that just yet. Several years ago, there were some pure D4 antagonists in development for schizophrenia. And I did a trial with one of them and it, it didn't quite work for overall psychosis, but it did have some interesting uh, effects, brightening or kind of measures of cognition, but it was not an effective antipsychotic by itself. And you're right, that kind of came from the fact that there's affinity for D4 with clozapine. Yeah, the D1 story is very interesting. If you overdrive it and overstimulate it, you can cause psychosis. That's the mechanism of amphetamine psychosis, for instance. But too little stimulation causes cognitive impairment. Yes, it has to be just right. Yeah. And you need a like a secret recipe for D1, D2, D3, D4 mm-hmm. okay. that has eluded us. Exactly. This is why I guess people have looked beyond dopamine, directly dopamine receptor active agents. What, what other neurotransmitter systems are people looking at? Besides dopamine, uh, we talked a little bit about serotonin. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's also some additional research looking at serotonin as a cause of, of psychosis, uh, specifically mm-hmm. in Parkinson's disease. Mm-hmm. And, and here we, we have a lesion that affects uh, the RAFE, which, uh, uh, where serotonin cell bodies are, the uh, serotonergic cell bodies reside, leads... Um, to an upregulation of 5-HT2A receptors. Mm -hmm. And so there's a thought if we can just target 5-HT2A receptors and turn them off Mm -hmm. in uh, aberrant signaling uh, situations such as Parkinson's disease psychosis, we can treat psychosis. And actually, this has been also looked at in schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. It it only uh, got us so far Mm -hmm. because we know that there's uh, all sorts of lesions everywhere that we can't really characterize in a living person, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we're not quite there yet with a pure 5-HT2A inverse agonist just, just for schizophrenia itself. But it's looked at very carefully for, in addition to Parkinson's disease psychosis, dementia-related psychosis. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be a potential use of, of an agent like that that would be better tolerated in general than a, than an, a dopamine receptor antagonist. Yeah. But the other receptor that, of course, has got a lot of attention over the past 20 years has been uh, those involved with the glutamatergic pathway. Exactly, yes. So the NMDA receptor, for mm-hmm. example, is uh, actually quite a complicated receptor mm-hmm. uh, in association with other glutamatergic receptors such as AMPA and kinate. They play a large role in regulating dopamine downstream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if we can affect uh, glut- glut receptors in a very specific way, we may be able to modify dopamine output in a very specific way, perhaps increasing dopamine signaling in the cortex and mm-hmm. decreasing dopamine signaling subcortically, let's say in the ventral striatum. Mm-hmm. We can do that magic, and we've treated schizophrenia and negative symptoms and cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia trick is finding something that does that. We can't give glutamate, of course, but we can give things that agents that increase the activity of that receptor. In general, there's a theory called the the hypofunctioning NMDA receptor hypothesis of Mm -hmm. schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. 
that NMDA receptors, uh, perhaps located on GABA interneurons, we'll get into GABA in just a moment, is a core feature of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And if we can just increase that functionality of that NMDA receptor, perhaps by giving the coagonist glycine or things that look like glycine, mm -hmm. or increase the availability of glycine by inhibiting its uh, transporter out of the synapse and make it more present, we can increase the activity of the MMDA receptor and restore function. That's one thought. We haven't gotten very far with that yet, though. Not that we haven't tried. Right. You mentioned the three glutamate receptors you mentioned are the ionotropic glutamate receptors, and there are also metabotropic glutamate receptors. And several years ago, there were some agents in development that worked on metabotropic receptors that unfortunately didn't pan out either. So the, the glutamate system, while uh, it's very complicated, and while people have been trying to find agents that work, it's so far it hasn't panned out. I'm glad you mentioned the metabotropic receptors. They actually are quite complicated. We don't know exactly what the mechanism of action is there. I mean, there were several hypotheses, but they were difficult to put our arms around. Mm -hmm. It's far easier to think about the NMDA receptor hypofunctioning hypothesis. Yes. Yes. But in general, if we can somehow modulate the glutamatergic pathway and then downstream modulate, we can treat schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. The challenge is finding something that does that is well tolerated mm -hmm. and uh, can be uh, the medicinal chemist can actually manufacture. How about some other neurotransmitters? There are many. Yes. So <laughs> there, <laughs> there are. What's really exciting are the trace amine associated receptors. These are a fairly recent discovery. They're predominantly intracellular receptors that modulate neurotransmission and monominergic neurons, such as dopaminergic neurons. Mm -hmm. Now, these trace amine-associated receptors can have pre- and postsynaptic effects, and there's crosstalk, so to speak, between the dopamine system and TAR1 systems. So the whole network of receptors talk to each other in ways that are not fully understood. But theoretically, there's thought that we can modulate the dopaminergic neurotransmission earlier on, like upstream, mm -hmm. through TAR1 receptor agonism. Mm -hmm. So there is an agent being developed by Synovian, and it's mm -hmm. been known for a very long time, CEP363856, and now has a name. Mm -hmm. And I keep on forgetting this name. <laughs> so please remind me. The name is Eulotarant. Yeah, so it's going to take some getting used to and learning how we're supposed to pronounce it. But it is so new, it just got named like very recently. Yes. So this agent is actually an agonist at TAR1 receptors. It also has the binding properties at 5-HT1A serotonin receptors, as well as 5-HT1D and 5-HT7. So that's interesting in and of itself as well. It's not just TAR1. Mm -hmm. And all this would be all well and good, but a clinical trial actually demonstrated efficacy in people with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And so this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020 a journal not really known for publishing much in the way of psychiatry, but when something new and novel and really revolutionary comes up, they, they really grab at it, and it was published there. So a very prestigious journal to publish a psychiatry clinical trial in. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, four-week study. Flexibly dosed CEP363856 was administered, 50 or 75 milligrams a day, and compared with placebo. And the patients all had an acute exacerbation of schizophrenia, much like all other antipsychotic drug trials have been conducted. And the positive negative syndrome scale, or PANS, was the primary outcome measure. Again, the gold standard that's used all the time. And the CEP363856 molecule separated from placebo. And at the end of the study, this separation was statistically significant, actually quite robust. So this is more than just proof of concept. This was actually a, a reasonably large clinical trial of over 200 participants, close to 250, and gives us evidence that, hey, we have something that doesn't block dopamine D2 receptors directly, and yet it reduces the symptoms of schizophrenia as measured by the PANS. Moreover, there was an interesting signal for a decrease in the PANS negative subscale score, mm -hmm. modest, but there. Mm -hmm. So here we have a, an agent that is completely different 
from what we've had over the years. And different from not only bigger than the difference between a second and a first generation antipsychotic. And although we sometimes call the dopamine receptor partial agonists the third generation, they still involve dopamine. <laughs> this is the first time that we actually have a signal that is looks very promising with something that does not affect dopamine D2 receptors directly. Yeah. And it's so reasonably well tolerated. There was somnolence and gastrointestinal symptoms, but there was no drug-induced Parkinsonism, as you would imagine. Mm -hmm. And metabolic outcomes showed no difference from placebo, which is really good news. Right. So no signal for weight gain or metabolic disturbance and no prolactin elevation, I understand? Correct. No prolactin elevation. Why would there be? Because you're not blocking postsynaptic D2 receptors. Directly, yeah. So it's interesting. You're not directly affecting dopamine, but indirectly, as you've mentioned, there are complex relationships between this intracellular TAR1 receptor and the dopamine system. Yes. My understanding is that if you stimulate TAR1, you're inhibiting both the synthesis and release of dopamine in relevant areas here of the brain. That's the current thinking that you're actually fundamentally altering what's happening with dopamine. And in the end, you're going to decrease the excessive dopamine activity occurring mm -hmm. in the ventral striatum. Mm -hmm. You're going to decrease delusions and hallucinations. And tantalizing, you may be increasing dopamine neurotransmission where you need it in the cortex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And could some of that be from the 5-HT1A agonism that this drug has? I'm glad you pointed that out because we have many agents that affect 5-HT1A as an agonist or partial agonist. Mm -hmm. And yes, affecting that receptor can have some beneficial effects in mood and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So that actually can be a, a very helpful feature of this experimental agent that we've been discussing. It's not just TAR1, it's TAR1+. plus. Yeah. Yeah, my understanding is there there is at least one other TAR1 agonist in development, but it may not have this particular receptor profile that we're talking about. Yes, it, there is another one that, that is being actively uh, investigated. It doesn't have that same pharmacodynamic fingerprint mm -hmm. as this one does. So I'm really curious to see what is going to be the effect on the psychopathology of schizophrenia with just examining TAR1. It may not be sufficient, but we have to wait and see. Yeah, and stimulation of 5-HT1A is interesting. It can lead to increased dopamine release in the prefrontal cortex. So there, there is evidence of that. So this could be magically addressing that yin and yang of too much dopamine and too little dopamine in different parts of the brain. That would be my fervent hope that we have a new option for schizophrenia that is sufficiently different from the others and perhaps better tolerated for many of our patients, mm -hmm. and perhaps working where other agents have not worked. We don't know that yet. That's certainly true. We all know that there is a certain percentage of patients with schizophrenia who are resistant to dopamine blockade. And obviously, they may have a different pathophysiology and might respond to this better than the others. Yeah, I agree, Andy, with that statement. And as we're both fond of saying, there's no such thing as schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. There are schizophrenias. That's right. And we just don't have the technology to identify what kind of schizophrenia an individual person has. We make our best guess with medicines, and we're prepared to you know, change our minds if we don't see the effects that are desired. Yeah. And this leads me to think again about clozapine, which probably is not working through dopamine blockade at all, or at least D2 blockade at all. And that may be why some patients who haven't responded to D2 antagonists do respond to clozapine. Yeah, an interesting observation is that clozapine has relatively weak binding affinity to postsynaptic D2 receptors, and it has some activity as a glycine transporter inhibitor. Interesting. Uh, which would make it very applicable to the idea that perhaps by increasing the availability of glycine at hypofunctioning NMDA receptors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we can improve uh, symptoms of schizophrenia that way. My understanding, it goes a little bit further, even that it may have some agonism at TAR1 uh, receptors as well. Yeah, that would be a, an interesting outcome, wouldn't it? Uh, it would help explain the mystery behind clozapine. So we've talked about how anticholinergic agents can certainly be uh, bad, if you will, for cognition. But it turns out there's a, a muscarinic cholinergic agonist in development actually, that, that seems to have some efficacy for schizophrenia. Yes, Andy, this is really exciting news. Mm 
because uh, it represents yet another way of treating schizophrenia without blocking uh, dopamine D2 receptors directly. And this takes advantage of the existence of brain circuits where muscarinic modulation of dopamine and glutamate occurs. And so if you can, the muscarinic receptors, you will affect dopamine and glutamate. And uh, so this is another avenue to treat psychosis. And this has been known for quite some time, actually. Over 10 years ago, a zonomaline, a muscarinic M1, M4 agonist, was noted to improve the symptoms of schizophrenia. Unfortunately, GI side effects limited further development. And someone had the idea that let's try to uh, give the benefits of M1, M4 agonism in the brain and at the same time prevent the peripheral cholinergic side effects that can occur, usually with M2, M3 receptors peripherally. So this was actually accomplished by adding trospium to xenomaline. And you have a xenomaline trospium combination approach. Trospium is a muscarinic receptor antagonist that does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So it actually blocks the unwanted peripheral cholinergic side effects of xenomaline. This was tested in a, a variety of studies. The most impressive one that got everyone's attention was a phase two clinical trial in people with acute schizophrenia. This was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021, a relatively uh, recent issue, actually. 200 patients with schizophrenia were randomized to receive xenomaline or trospium twice daily versus placebo. And the xenomaline trospium combination beat placebo on the positive and negative syndrome scale total score at the end of the five-week trial. The safety and adverse events were some constipation and nausea, dry mouth, dyspepsia, and vomiting, but nowhere near what you would have expected with xenomaline alone. So here is a potentially well-tolerated approach to treating schizophrenia that is not related to the blockade of dopamine D2 receptors and hence affecting dopamine neurotransmission in a, a less direct way upstream, so to speak and effectively treat schizophrenia. It's quite exciting. Yeah. Both the TAR-1 approach and the, the uh, approach looking at uh, muscarinic agonists represent breakthroughs that we haven't had up until. Certainly. And, and my understanding is, and, and this drug you're referring to is being developed by a company called Karuna, and the name is CAR-XT. I guess the CAR for Karuna, the X for xenomaline, and the T for trospium. Like the Yolotaron study that you mentioned, I, I believe there was some evidence from secondary endpoints that it also worked for negative symptoms and had some, some interesting uh, possible further efficacy. Yes, certainly. And so our hope is that these new approaches to treating schizophrenia will have successful phase three clinical trial programs. In the past, we've been disappointed, I have to say, mm -hmm. with uh, strong showings in phase two not being replicated in phase three, but my fingers are crossed on these two. Yeah, they're both in phase three development as we speak, I understand. And so these are larger studies, of course, greater than 200 patients. Now, there, there also have been some other strategies. I know, for instance, D-amino acid oxidase, and there have been some PDE drugs that have been studied. What can we say about that? Yes, I'm less enthusiastic about the other options. They, they have not been consistently shown to be efficacious, so we're not there yet. Maybe uh, we'll get lucky with a, another molecule that has just a different type of profile different enough to be uh, have a greater chance of success, but so far, not really. A good example of how tweaking a mechanism of act may still hold hope is the glycine transporter inhibition story, mm -hmm. where we, we had one that was studied about a decade ago, bidopertin, mm -hmm. and we had high hopes for it. A very, very promising phase two program led to a, an extensive phase three clinical development uh, program of, of several studies. Unfortunately, Phase three didn't work out, but let's not give up on glycine transporter inhibition. There's a, another molecule that is being developed by Bowring or Ingelheim mm -hmm. that works by glycine transport inhibition, glycine T1, like bidopertin, but a little different. And so perhaps uh, this will have a more successful phase three program, and it's being looked at in cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia and negative symptoms, antipsychotic augmentation, and so on, all the things that you would expect uh, 
glycine transport inhibition to possibly be helpful with. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'm hopeful that it seems like the science continues to evolve as we understand some of the pathophysiology and some of the connections of these different neurotransmitter systems. And they're complex. So yeah. it's really threading a needle to try to find a drug that does it just right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If our listeners want to read up more about uh, this uh, glycine transporter inhibitor, there was a, a report of a, a phase two trial in Lancet Psychiatry this year that it's, describes uh, how this product, is, it also is referred to by number BI425809, it improved cognition. And there, there may be some importance as per what would be the optimal dose. And uh, so I've, my fingers are crossed with that one too. They say innovation is dead it, in schizophrenia. It really is not, yeah, as we went over over the past 45 minutes or so. It is not dead. And we have several new approaches to uh, examine. Yeah, I'm particularly excited about the TAR1 agonist and the muscarinic agent. They're in a horse race here a little bit, neck and neck, as to who's going to hit the finish line first. But, of course, we have to, assuming they work, we'll have to sort out where to use them and how to use them. Do we use them as monotherapy in combination? These kinds of things. Yeah, it, it remains to be seen. I, I think the idea from the manufacturers is to demonstrate efficacy and out and out schizophrenia as a monotherapy. That'll open the door for us to use it as clinicians in any way we think would help our patients. So that may be as a monotherapy, maybe in addition to other treatments for schizophrenia, much as we do today. We don't always obey the label literally, mm -hmm. and, and we will use different approaches on our N of one clinical trials when we treat patients. <laughs> well said. I think it's it's very important as we're talking about this to think about this idea of going beyond dopamine and beyond directly D2 blockade in particular. And I think if, if we want to summarize this, let's talk about why it's so important to go beyond D2 and how these agents, both from an efficacy point of view and from a safety and tolerability point of view, where are we trying to go here? Number one, our treatments available today will not be efficacious for everyone. Mm -hmm. And we're left with patients who don't seem to improve in terms of their symptoms to a sufficient extent. Mm -hmm. We'll do our best. And some of them will be placed on clozapine, which, by the way, I think is underutilized. Mm -hmm. But there are even people who don't respond adequately to clozapine. We need a completely different approach. My hope is with different mechanisms of action for the different agents uh, under development that will have greater opportunity to see something work better. Maybe as monotherapy, maybe in combination. We know this to be true with other disease states such as mm -hmm. diabetes and hypertension, mm -hmm. as well as cancer. So there's nothing in, uh, in medical lore that says we can't do the same for schizophrenia. It may be having a more flexible approach uh, will be necessary. But it's hard to be flexible when all our drugs are very similar. Yeah. And as you've said, from an efficacy point of view, working better might mean working on patients who don't respond to other drugs. And I think we're talking mostly about positive symptoms there. But also working better means working on those other clusters of symptoms that we talked about, the negative symptoms, cognition, the mood, and so on. Absolutely. So there's heterogeneity amongst our patients in terms of the types of symptoms that affect them the most. It could be the positive symptoms, but we also understand negative symptoms and cognitive impairment can actually lead to greater impairments in functioning. Mm -hmm. so we need to be mindful about those. So we need an approach that treats all the symptoms in a global fashion. And we, we're not there yet. I'm hopeful that in the future, barring a, a cure or a way of preventing schizophrenia in the first place, I'm hopeful that we'll have ways of managing the myriad of symptoms that they present with. And then, of course, from a safety and tolerability point of view, why is it important to go beyond dopamine and, and the current agents? As we've explored earlier, the agents that we currently have to date all block dopamine D2 receptors postsynaptically, at least to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So they all have that element of the potential for drug-induced Parkinsonism. Now, there are some that actually have very little of that, mm -hmm. thanks to even very low occupancy, but it's still not zero. So I'm worried about the eventual production of tardive dyskinesia in those patients, mm -hmm. regardless of the absence of acute extrapyramidal side effects, such as drug-induced Parkinsonism or dystonia or that disturbance in gait or rigidity. So I won't expect that at all, but I'm still worried in the back of my mind about 
what is going to be the effect of blocking those D2 receptors, even though we're not doing it gung-ho, will it really eliminate the potential for TD? Maybe not. You may be referring to the newest kid on the block, lumetaparone. Yes. So lumetaparone is a very interesting agent that has a 60-fold higher affinity to 5-HT2A receptors than it does to D2 receptors. And when you uh, measure the occupancy of the D2 receptor, it's quite low on on par with clozapine. Mm -hmm. And so you don't expect any drug-induced Parkinson's, nor, nor do you see it, but it's still binding to those D2 receptors. I'd rather yes. develop a way of treating schizophrenia that doesn't bind to postsynaptic D2 receptors if I can do that. Yeah. And I'm really curious about what is the longer-term prospect then of eliminating TD from our vocabulary. That would be quite something. I agree. TD is really one of the, one of the true scourges, I think, of, of treating schizophrenia right now. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad we have treatments for it today. We didn't have before, but I'd still like to avoid it if I can. Mm-hmm. And then there's the myriad of other side effects that can be problematic. And the second generation of psychotics have basically given us a new plague of weight gain, abnormalities, and how glucose is regulated. and. Mm-hmm elevations we see in triglycerides and cholesterol that we'd rather not see in our patients. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the newer second-generation antipsychotics have less an effect on on that than others, but it's also something I'd like to avoid entirely too. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems coming, the atypicals along with the D2 blockade, there are other receptors and other actions that lead to these other things as well. So maybe coming at it from a completely different point of view, such as the two newer drugs we talked about. You mentioned the receptor profile for the eulodoron, the TAR1 agonist, is interesting, but it doesn't seem to have anticholinergic or antihistamine or some of these other receptors that may be causing these other things. Yes, and and going back to Pima Vanserin, I didn't say it by name, but that's the 5-HT2A inverse agonist Mm -hmm. that basically that's all it does. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has a very clean receptor binding profile. Doesn't mean it's immune from side effects, mm-hmm. but it, it just it doesn't have the same ones that we see time and time again with the agents that we have today that have uh, quite a complex pharmacodynamic profile. Yeah, sadly that one. And there was another one I studied years ago, M one hundred nine oh seven, that was a pure five HT two A antagonist. By themselves, they're not great for schizophrenia. By themselves, they do seem to work for the psychosis of. Parkinson's and uh, dementias, as you mentioned. Unfortunately, we go back to the dictum of one of my favorite professors who used to say, dirty drugs are better. (laughs) What he was referring to was drugs that have more complex mechanisms of action, rich receptor binding profiles. Yeah, it could be the secret sauce that leads to the decrease in symptoms. It could be, let's throw everything at the wall, see what sticks. So I, I think what we need is a variety of different approaches, Mm-hmm. Some more simple, some more complex, to allow our, our patients to try them out, see what works best for them, to see what helps their symptoms the most, what they tolerate the best, and what they're willing to take. You know, you mentioned earlier, Les, that some people think there's a lack of innovation. And I certainly, over the years, I've studied many new kinds of novel mechanisms and agents that failed. And I don't think it's a lack of innovation at all. As a matter of fact, you mentioned recently there seems to be quite an ups- upswing in these novel agents. I think it's really been a failure of our biomarkers and of identifying maybe more homogeneous pathophysiologies of this term we call the schizophrenia. It's not like some of you mentioned also treatment in other fields of medicine. Some of our colleagues have genetic markers, for instance, so that, for instance, can determine which chemotherapy I'm going to give you in oncology. And we unfortunately just don't have that yet. Right. We don't have a way of identifying ahead of time what a person will optimally respond to. We, we just don't know. So it's a lot of trial and error. Mm-hmm. Perhaps in the future, we can develop some biomarkers that will help us guide to what treatment we can use. Right now, whatever testing we have available is focused on the metabolism of agents. Mm-hmm. So we have a fairly good idea of, uh, let's say, agents that are metabolized through CYP2D6 and we, we learn how to dose them better, maybe ahead of time by knowledge about their 2D6 metabolism and their profile. Mm-hmm. But that's about it. It doesn't get at the core issue of whether this drug will work or not. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. And uh, this has been a really wonderful and interesting discussion of the state of the art, where we're at with our 
developments in the treatment of schizophrenia. Les, I really enjoyed it. I want to thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Andy. It was a real pleasure. Okay, so please don't forget to tune in to the other podcasts on the NEI page. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your participation in this NEI CME podcast episode. To receive your certificate of CME credit, please refer to this podcast's description page for a link to go online and print your certificate. This concludes the CME podcast presentation. Thank you.